very welcome to this uh, professor presentation. My name is Ellen Wittendorfer-Rutz. I'm a professor in insurance medicine, and I'm also the head of the division of insurance medicine. And in this capacity, I'm also the acting head of the department of clinical neuroscience. Today, I want to talk about migration, mental health, and insurance medicine. We are living in a very special time. This is data from UNHCR, the latest one, showing that 86.5 million people are today internally displaced. This is an enormous amount of people. This is nearly the entire Swedish population, right? Of those, 40 million are internally displaced, 25.4 million refugees, and 3.1 million asylum seekers. An enormous amount of people, as I said. And of course, this makes something with our societies. With more and more, our societies become multicultural. I was interested to compare this to other periods in human history, because of course, migration is not something new, right? This is something which has been historical, of course, been the case. And I found this information during and after World War II, between 1939 and 1950, 30 million people migrated. So this is approximately half of what we see today. Even if, of course, the, the statistics at that time were not that precise as there might be today, but still, there might not be enormous differences. When we do migration research, we have to consider pre-migration factors. So what were the factors uh, influencing the individual before deciding to leave the home country? This is a picture from Syria, because I'm focusing my lecture quite a lot on refugees. Migration factors are important, particularly for refugees, because it might be very, very specific um, influences also during this period and traumatic life events. We know these pictures far too well, uh, people in, on the rubble boat in the Mediterranean Sea. I was always wondering how this might feel and also when you decide to flee and what you take with you. And I found this on the internet, it's an artist uh, making interviews with refugees and also making photos about those things which they took with them. So this is one example. Uh, the person is called Noor, he's 20 years of age. He comes from Syria, he's an artist himself. And he fled when the bombs, when he heard the bombs in the distance. And he took very few things with him. As you can see here, a rosary, a t-shirt, and some um, presents from friends. Of course, not all people are exposed to traumatic life events and not all people kind of also are very affected by these traumatic life events. This is a picture symbolizing what we call in migration um, theory the healthy migrant effect. Meaning that if you have the strength to kind of overcome all kinds of obstacles and also can move to another country under very difficult circumstances, then you also have the strength to um, hold up a good health and a good mental health. And you know, all know these people, right? Uh, and they have one thing in common, they also ha are refugees or have a background as refugees. So let's keep that in mind when we also look at the results, which I will show you. Post-migration factors are also very important. I told you pre-migration factors, migration factors, and post-migration factors. This is um, a picture and results from the World Value Survey, which is carried out every year. And what you see here on the x-axis is a degree of self-expression, so individualization. And on the y-axis, you see the degree of traditional values in the society. And then you see different countries depicted on this uh, x and y axis. What you see on the top right is Sweden. So Sweden is the world's most individualized and the most secularized country. And of course, many people coming, from, uh, coming as refugees to our countries 
come from traditional, much more traditional and much more non-individualized um, countries. And of course this matters, because then you have to adapt to a society which is very different to the society where you come from. So let's keep that also in mind when we look at the results. Migration and mental health, this is the focus of my presentation today. These are findings from uh, different register studies and uh, we have been carrying out uh, some of them uh, on refugees in my research group. And what you can see here is the prevalence of diagnosis specific healthcare, so this is specialized healthcare, among refugees compared to individuals born in Sweden for four years. What you can see is that depressive disorders, anxiety disorders and adjustment disorders are considerably more prevalent than in individuals born in Sweden. For example, 3% compared to 1.9 for depressive disorders. Bipolar disorder is a little bit, is much more, uh, much less frequent. And uh, you can also see that there are the differences are not that strong. The strongest differences are with post-traumatic stress disorder. This might not be surprising to you. We all know that this is a disorder which might be kind of most prevalent in refugees. And the difference we see here is an approximately tenfold difference. And we see that also in different studies um, from other sources, not only from specialized healthcare. What do we have to take in, into consideration when we talk about healthcare treatment and mental disorders in, in refugees? Well, First, the access to healthcare might be restricted for refugees in some countries. The help seeking might be very different because the stigma of mental disorders might be much stronger than in our countries. Language barriers, of course. We cannot assume that all treating physicians have a competence in transcultural psychiatry and psychology, so they might not get the right diagnosis and the right treatment. And we don't know very much about suicidal behavior which is in refugees, which is surprising because as I told you there are so many uh, groups of people uh, internally displaced and also refugees coming to low, high income countries, among them in Sweden, but still the research is very much lagging behind. As you, I guess you are not all suicide researchers, I wanted to show you also some slide describing the suicidal process. How can we um, imagine this? Very often it starts with a depressive situation, a very difficult life situation, a psychiatric disorder. At least a situation which is subjective, not tolerable. This situation can then move to depressive thinking or hopelessness. Hopelessness is a very strong factor, a driving factor in the suicidal process, of course, because it matters if you can see some kind of light in the end of the tunnel. This might develop then to psychic pain and then to the solution for suicide. What you can see here in the last picture is a tunnel. This is a conceptualized idea and theory in suicidal be behavior research that people in this situation have very much difficulties to have coping strategies to solve their life situation. The only thing what you see is a tunnel, the only solution what you see is to take your life. So I told you that there are a lot of studies missing and, and we, we don't really know very much about uh, suicide and refugees. So in my research group we carried out a number of studies related to this and these are register studies, so several registers are merged and I will show you a little bit about the study design so that you have approximately an idea. We took a cohort of people 2004, these are between 16 and 64 years and resident in Sweden, it's approximately 4.9 million in the host population, so me, people born in Sweden and 197,000 refugees. The exposure status is refugee status, as I told you, the baseline. And then we followed up these individuals from 2005 to 2013 with regard to self-harm and suicide. And of course, we had a lot of 
confounding factors and covariates in these models as we usually do in order to guarantee that the association between refugee status and suicide, which we are looking for, is not actually explained by differences in other factors. When we started the study, of course, we had the hypothesis that refugees must have a higher suicide risk, right? And a higher risk for self-harm. Simply because we know that refugees have a higher risk for mental disorders, and mental disorders are very strong driving factor and the strongest risk factors for suicidal behavior. And we know also that they have been often exposed to traumatic life events, which in itself is a risk factor for suicidal behavior. So let's look at the findings. We look here at self-harm in refugees, where there's the host population in Sweden. One is the reference group, so this is the people in Sweden, born in Sweden. And what we found it is a lower risk of self-harm in refugees. This was very surprising. As I told you, we had a completely different hypothesis. When we looked at the specific countries, actually, this was kind of consistent. You see here uh, refugees from Eritrea and Somalia, also lower risk estimates, Ethiopia the same. The only country actually where we found a somewhat higher risk for self-harm compared to the population born in Sweden was refugees born in Iran. Similar patterns were found for suicide. So when we published this, this is published in the British Journal of Psychiatry, we were of course interested Okay, so if this is the situation in the whole population of refugees, what happens if you have a mental disorder? Is this then the same pathway, or does it differ? So we carried out a study, which is also published now, on mental disorders and hospitalization due to self-harm in Swedish-born and refugees. It's coming from a similar cohort, actually. So what you see in the first slide is those without a mental disorder. And you see the Swedish born in light blue and the refugees in the darker color. So without mental disorders, a somewhat lower risk for self-harm in refugees. And with a mental disorder, a much lower risk for self-harm in refugees. Also this was very surprising, because we thought that the traumatic life events would kind of really drive the risk even in mental disorders. We found that also that this was true for all mental disorders with exception of schizophrenia, bipolar disorders and personality disorders. These disorders might be simply so severe that other psychosocial factors matter less. This at least was our conclusion of these findings. You might remember from 2017 that there was more or less kind of every week some report on the suicide of an unaccompanied minor seeking asylum in Sweden. This was very drastic. At the time we were really kind of anxious. What is happening here? What, what is uh, happening to these people? And there were a lot of humanitarian organizations who also warned about this. At the same time we didn't have any idea kind of how prevalent it really is. We only had the information on this anecdotal evidence in the newspapers. So I started to discuss this with the colleagues, and uh, you might remember also that this was the group of people who came to Sweden during 2015, more than 35,000 unaccompanied minors seeking asylum in Sweden during that year. So we discussed uh, that we should do something about this, and, um, of course, as an epidemiologist and public health specialist, it is the basis to know how prevalent of, uh, this phenomenon is in this group in order to design cultural sen sensitive and also tailor-made intervention. And as I told you, at this time we didn't have any aggregate information. So we kept contact 23 actors. This was uh, a study which took not even a year, it was funded by the National Board of Health and Welfare, but it was very intense and very rewarding also because um, we could get a lot of information from different sources, but in the end we could only use information for four actors. Most of the others either didn't have this information or had problems of giving this information to us. So the agencies which then finally contributed with 
knowledge on this was the Swedish Migration Agency, the National Board of Health and Welfare, the National Board of Forensic Medicine, and voluntary organizations. And without these voluntary organizations, actually, we would never be able to have been doing this study. Because they have been collecting information on death of unaccompanied minors who they have been in contact with. And this information we could go to the National Board of Forensic Medicine and get this diagnosis validated. validated. So let's look at the figures. The number of suicides and the total population and suicide rates per 100,000 persons in unaccompanied asylum-seeking minors and youth, because we included people from between 10 and 21 years. This was the interest of the National Board of Health and Welfare in 2017. So let's start with the population in Sweden. A suicide rate of 6.1, which is approximately medium suicide rate in that age group. And then we looked at the unaccompanied refugee minors seeking asylum, and this was 41.2, which is an enormous suicide rate in this age group. I don't think that you would ever find any country with such high suicide rates. You would have to go to specific areas with very vulnerable groups to find similar rates. So of course this was very alarming and at that time we were discussing very much also with the media and with other agencies. What could be the reason for this? As an, I told you, we had also data from some other sources and we knew that suicide was the most common cause of death, nearly the exclusive cause of death of these people. The most common method of suicide was by hanging and uh, this is a drastic method and unfortunately very lethal and also difficult to prevent. All youth or minors who committed suicide in 2017 were boys or young men, and the majority came from Afghanistan. All had traumatic life events, and not only one. It was really one after the other after the other. So a very exposed group. All who committed suicide in 2017 had actually applied for it at the asylum in 2015. So all had waited at least two years for their uh, decision on their asylum application, which is a long time. And we know from research that this can also worsen your mental health. So what we told also the National Board of Health and Welfare is that this is really an, a vulnerable group. We really have to monitor their suicidal behavior for the years to come. And we actually have to do something immediately. Because if you see figures like that, you probably don't have to wait uh, in order to see that it is similarly high the year after. You just have to do something. So some processes are, of course, already taken. Uh, this is kind of some years ago now. So what could these differences be about? The first studies I told you were on refugees with a residence permit, right? And then I told you one study on unaccompanied minors seeking asylum, so they don't have their residence permit yet. So one explanation could, of course, be the culture and the religion which contributes to how you kind of perceive mental health disorders and how you, if, and uh, how you uh, look for health and how much uh, these mental disorders are affected with stigma. Culture might, of course, also have an individual, an, an effect on the individual's attitudes towards suicidal behavior. If a person acts on suicidal behavior, if you decide to kind of not only have these thoughts, but also act upon them. Most of the countries with lower suicide rates were actually from the Muslim majority countries, so religion really might play a role there. And then there might be protective factors, which we don't know very much about, because I told you that research is so limited up to date, which might be social connectedness and, and resilience. But we have to keep in mind that there are specific risk groups, and these are the asylum-seeking unaccompanied minors. I'm now also involved in a study on uh, looking at asylum-seeking unaccompanied minors in Denmark to, in order to compare if they are equally um, vulnerable in, in another country and as in Sweden. I told you, or at least the 
title implies that I will not only talk about migration and mental health, but I will also talk about insurance medicine. My professorship is in insurance medicine, and uh, not everybody might know what this is, so I took here an, a definition from the Cochrane Insurance Medicine Collaboration. How they define it is insurance medicine covers medical assessments and interventions for all types of insurance schemes that involve health aspects. For example, sickness allowance or disability pension for health-related incapacity to work. So you have to have the disease, and this disease must have led to work incapacity. What this research is very much about is to understand pathways to work incapacity, and also prognosis after long-term, for example, sickness absence, but also to understand and to develop intervention models so that we can get people back to work who have been on sickness absence for a long time. Mental disorders are, the, to date, among the main reasons for work disability. That's why this is very important. Actually, in nearly all OECD countries to date, mental disorders are the driving forces of people not being in the labor market any longer. It's no longer musculoskeletal disorders, it's mental disorders today. And the proportion of mental disorders among all people with work disability, meaning sickness, absence, and disability pension, has been rising. In Sweden, in, very, in some 10, 15 years, from 25% to 50%, an enormous rise. So these are the driving forces today, that people cannot work any longer. Of course, you can see here, work disability as the social consequences of the disease, which obviously has a strong effect on your life if you cannot be part of the labor market any longer. The main diagnosis of work disability, meaning sickness, absence, and disability pension, are common mental disorders. And here we often mean depressive and anxiety disorders. In Sweden, actually, it's 95% among those sickness absent have a depressive or an anxiety disorder. And the literature regarding uh, mental disorders in refugees is also very limited. Actually, I, when we started with these uh, uh, studies, uh, we could not find a single study on the refugees and white disability. And again, very surprising, our societies have been changing. And I think that we need the evidence in order to have a better understanding. Now we have been producing two studies and I will show you a little bit about this and we are carrying on many more. But a little bit to the background, why do mental disorders have an effect on worker capacity and on the social functioning? In order to explain this to you, I want to show you some parts of a film made by the World Health Organization. I can very much recommend this. Uh, it's a beautiful film. It's a comic film. And uh, the name of the film is, is I Had a Black Dog, his name was Depression. So what happens when you have a depressive disorder and what happens to your working capacity? This picture shows the black dog eating up your brain, so it kind of symbolizes the cognitive problems you have when you have a depressive disorder. And of course this matters a lot on your working capacity the day after, right, if you cannot concentrate. Many, or almost all jobs, you have to have a good functional uh, capacity with regard to concentration. Many activities in life in, are involved with enormous efforts. It takes you really efforts even to go up in the morning, and of course this matters then also on your capacity to work. It affects your social functioning. Here you see the, the, the person with the depressive disorder only talking with the black dog, everybody else is much taller, so you kind of, you're isolated in this situation. And there are many jobs where we have to have the, the social capacity, for example, nurses. They have to meet people every day, so if you have a depression, then of course this part of your work is affected. Your sleep is affected. Here the picture of the black dog sitting on you and you are com completely unable to sleep. And of course this matters a lot on your health and your concentrational ability the day after. And then there's a lot of stigma. I told you that in some cultures where m many refugees come from, the stigma might be even stronger. But also in our countries, there's still stigma attached to this. And I think we should work towards 
minimizing this. But you feel constantly that other people already know about it. So you try to kind of not talk about the symptoms sometimes and what is related then to the working situation. You might not tell, tell your supervisors or your, your colleagues. And this, of course, has in the long run then also an effect if you look for help and if you get health care or not. So what I think is important in insurance medicine to have a perspective on the labor market when it, we talk about refugees. Not only sickness absence and disability pension, but also unemployment. The reason being is that our sickness absence scheme in, in Sweden allows you only to get sickness benefits related to sickness absence when you're in the labor market, when you have a work, right? We also know that refugees have a lower likelihood to be in the labor market, so they might not, even if they have a disease, they might not be eligible to sickness allowance, they would be eligible to unemployment. So that's why we have to look at this, because otherwise we miss this part, right? Some of the determinants of labor market marginalization among migrants in the host country, for example in Sweden, are of course, as I told you, the definition of the social insurance policy and the labor market policies. The social economic status matters a lot, the degree of education. Of course, your level of morbidity, the mental disorders or comorbid disorders, the area where you live, and of course also discrimination, unfortunately, and language barriers. And the political and the labor market situation in the host country when you enter the country, because it matters if you come to a host country which has a period of high unemployment or not, if you arrive. So let's, let me tell you a little bit about some of the findings which we have up until now. Refugees have a higher risk for long-term unemployment, approximately 2.4-fold, long-term sickness absence, approximately 10%, and disability pension, 4% increased risk compared to the native population. So the strongest effect is, of course, on unemployment, as I told you. The highest risk of unemployment in refugees are in those from Syria, Afghanistan, and Somalia. And the highest risk of work disability in refugees from former Yugoslavia, Iran, and Iraq. Refugees with a longer duration of stay in Sweden, so more than 10 years, have a lower risk of unemployment. Of course, the longer you stay, the more you know the situation, the more you can come into the labor market, and the less you are exposed to long-term unemployment any longer. But the opposite is true for work disability. Maybe also due to the reasons that the more you come into the labor market, the more you're also eligible to get these benefits. It is also interesting in this context that all-cause mortality, it's not only suicide in refugees which is lower, but all-cause mortality is also lower. So it's interesting that these social outcome measures of mental disorders like work disability are higher. So there must be some kind of driving process on a more social level and not on the health level only, which we have to understand much better in the future. What we also found is a strong interaction between mental disorders and refugee status with regard to subsequent disability pensions, so meaning leaving the labor market due to work disability. And this looks like that. You see here, again, the same colors, the Swedish-born and the refugees. The Swedish-born with no mental disorder have a hazard ratio of one, and the refugees with no mental disorders have a higher risk. But if you have a mental disorder, the risk difference is very much larger. So we're still trying to understand this. Mortality risk lower, but the disability pension risk much, much higher when you have a mental disorder. So what happens? We have, and this is, so I include some of the research questions which we will have in the future. So what do I think we have to do is to have a transcultural perspective in insurance medicine, but also, of course, in psychiatric epidemiology, which we already have, but in insurance medicine we don't have it. We have to understand more about the diagnostics and the differences in the clinical manifestation of symptoms between cultural groups. And we have to understand more about these cultural differences with regard to 
assessment, workability assessment, for example. And this we now have to know because otherwise we cannot develop cultural sensitive treatments and cultural sensitive intervention methods. I would like to finalize this presentation which telling you a little bit about a um, big study consortium uh, which we are carrying out in my research group right now with five different other universities. It's called REMAIN on refugees, minors and integration. What we want to do is to look at the comparative effectiveness of antidepressant treatment in young people with a refugee background and those born in Sweden. Do they work the sim uh, in a similar way? Are they used in a similar way or not? And we want to test an intervention method which is called Problem Management Plus, which is a cognitive behavioral based uh, method and delivered by lay therapists. And then we want to compare this between the Netherlands, Denmark and Sweden. With PM Plus we have been already studying now in Amsterdam and if it works we also are interested in testing this in Stockholm. This is a method which has been shown at least in low-income countries to work. Some of the co-authors here are included in the Remain project which I told you about. This is a, an example from Pakistan and now we want to take this method to our high income countries and see if it works on young people and on refugees. This is only to symbolize how important it is to understand the complexity when we talk about insurance medicine. We have to look at the individual perspective, at the healthcare perspective, but also at the work situation and the political and all the legislation uh, parts. And of course, seen in a societal context. If we don't see that in this multifactorial perspective, we lose quite a lot of information. So what I want to really kind of postulate is that we need transcultural insurance medicine. And we have been now working quite strongly in order to kind of yeah, educate this field. And why do we need this? I think we have to open a transcultural paradigm in insurance, in insurance medicine and also in suicidal behavior research, which is not there either. And this we have to do to meet all the challenges we have in our contemporary societies with a lot of different cultures and to understand all these differences is extremely important. And with this I want to end this presentation. Thank you very much for listening.